This is the AG620 from Deepcool. It's a dual tower, dual fan air cooler with a pretty beefy 260 watt TDP. And that means it should be able to handle the latest power hungry CPUs. I'm gonna show you what comes in the box. We'll talk about the features. I'll show you how to install it. And then we'll test it out on a 13th gen Intel Core i7 13700K. Let's do it. So on top, there's a little box with a bunch of stuff. This is a little splitter cable that'll let you get both fans connected to a single header on your motherboard. This bag has all the mounting hardware that you're gonna need for Intel and AMD sockets. And this is the included thermal paste. It comes in this little packet instead of a syringe. It's kind of weird. I've never seen it packaged this way before. Installation guide. There's lots of pictures to make setup easy. And here's the cooler. With the fans, this guy measures 129 by 136 by 157 millimeters. And 157 is the height, by the way, so that's how high it's physically gonna sit above your motherboard. And it weighs about 1300 grams. Like, it's a big cooler, but you know what? It needs to be if it's gonna have a shot at cooling 260 watts. The cold plate's made from copper. It comes with the usual protective plastic film, and there's no pre-applied thermal paste. You're gonna have to do that yourself with that little packet that they gave you, or go with your own if you wanna find something different. Heat gets transferred up the stack with six six millimeter diameter heat pipes. Notice the end treatment, or lack thereof, that's probably the most significant difference between this and the more expensive AK620 model, where there's some fancy plastic covers capping off the ends of the heat pipes. So you're basically trading off some aesthetic appeal for a lower price. The heatsink uses densely stacked aluminum fins in this unique looking checkerboard design. I think this takes the otherwise basic looking design on the whole thing and kicks it up a notch. It looks cool. The unit's powered by two 120 millimeter fans and they just connect to the sides of the heatsink with some wire mounting clips. Very standard for this type of heatsink. The speed range is 300 to 1850 RPM. Max airflow is about 68 CFM and static pressure is just a touch above two millimeters H2O. And to keep things consistent with that basic bare bones design direction, there's no RGB, no ARGB, no lighting of any kind, just plain old basic black fans. When it comes to the installation process, there's not a lot to it. It's actually pretty easy. Since I'm installing on Intel LGA1700, the first steps to get the screw posts on the back plate in the right position. There's different positions on there for different Intel sockets. LGA1700 is the furthest position outward. Now flipping over to the other side of the motherboard, the back plate just slides right into place behind the socket. And then that gets screwed down with a set of four thumb screw standoffs. These are the mounting brackets. They have three different positions that support different sockets and they're numbered one to three. You can read it right on there. For LJ1700, I need to use spot number two. These just drop into place onto the standoffs that we just installed and then they get torqued down with another set of thumb screws and then I like to just go back over each one with a screwdriver to make sure they're nice and tight. Now for the thermal paste application, like I'm not exactly proud of this, it's not the best I've done, but it's really not that easy to get a nice blob in the middle or right where you want it with this little packet. It's definitely more precise when you've got it in a syringe. Now I'm just gonna lower the cooler down onto the CPU and you do have to remove the middle fan, by the way, in order to expose the mounting screws. And then you just go back and forth applying even pressure until they're tightened down. Now we can reinstall that middle fan with the included wire clips. Just make sure to secure it on both sides. And then for power, I'm connecting both fans to the splitter cable that came in the box. And then I'm connecting that to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Once you get it installed, you can really get a feel for how big it is. In fact, you need to pay attention to what kind of RAM you're using with this cooler because it hangs over the top and doesn't leave a ton of room. It could cause a conflict with taller RAM modules, plus it'll block any RGB that you might have there. Quick overview of the test system. The CPU is the Core i7-13700K and an Asus Prime Z790 motherboard. There's 32 gigabytes of DDR5 at 5200 megahertz. GPU is the Intel Arc A770 limited edition. Storage is a single one terabyte NVMe SSD, operating systems Windows 11, and it's all being powered by a 1200 watt Corsair HX PSU. To stress the CPU, I ran the multi-core test in Cinebench R23 for 10 straight minutes. Average temperatures over the test were 90C on the performance cores and 81 on the efficiency cores. A good result for an affordably priced air cooler on a CPU in this class. The data at the bottom of the charts shows the system idle temps. 
Looking at system sound levels, things were pretty much whisper quiet until the stress testing where levels peaked out at about 43 decibels, which is quite noticeable. You're definitely gonna hear it when the fans kick into high gear on this thing. These are the maximum temperatures recorded for the hottest cores. These numbers are not sustained for any significant period of time. They're instantaneous spikes, and according to Intel, anything under 100C is okay when you're talking about these intermittent ups and downs. And just for fun, I recorded the average CPU package power draw, which hit a massive 230 watts, almost the limit of the AG620's rated cooling performance. Synthetic benchmarks and stress tests are a great way to see the maximum performance of a cooler, but what does that really mean in a more real-world typical usage scenario? To find out, I fired up CSGO and did some 1080p gaming. Average temps for both types of cores were under 50C, with spikes up to 61 on the P cores and 49 on the E cores. That's an awesome result. It means the CPU is nowhere near its throttle zone, and there's plenty of headroom available for it to hit its maximum boost clocks, which means we should be getting the most performance that we can out of the hardware. Overall, I think Deepcool hit a home run with the AG620. It seems to live up to that 260 watt TDP performance claim based on the testing I did here. And they're only asking $55 for it. That price for this level of performance is a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. As long as you're cool with the rather minimal looking design and no ARGB, then you really can't go wrong. Unless you have tall RAM, in which case you can go wrong. At the end of the day, it's a great cooler, it's easy to install, and you can get it at a great price. What more can you really ask for? So I'm gonna have the purchasing links, um, all the specs and details for you down in the description. Make sure you check that stuff out. Give the video a thumbs up and get subscribed for more content. And we'll see you soon.